And other than that, like I said, this uh um a proud dad of four and inspired by to uh to to by my classmates who to see how y'all have uh kept it going. I you know, I remember the days back when actually we all met and you know that kind of stuff and and it's and it's inspiring, man. <laughs> to see uh, a good a good relationship and then how y'all do what y'all do. And of course, uh brother Wright here, Dr. Wright, uh back at Perkins was was a uh, young man that took me up well, he took took me this took this young man up in his arms and when I was trying to uh make it to to the drum line and and showed me the ropes and uh and always been a good brother over the years. So I'm I'm awesome. uh, honored to awesome. be here. We are so thankful that you uh, wanted to join us on tonight. We don't take it for granted that um, you joined us. We are very appreciative to the fact that you wanted to bless us with your presence on today. So, Dr. Wright, please introduce yourself. Well, good evening. I am evening. Tim Wright, and I am so glad to be here. Now, I was a little bit uh, concerned because this, this is date night with Pastor William and Wendy, but you have us here. So I was wondering, what are we doing here? Right, right. <laughs> yes, we didn't rehearse. I just want you to know that we did not rehearse. That's good. Uh, That's Dr. good. Uh, Goggins and I have not spoken. And please forgive me if I say Billy or or Lele or 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 uh, artist, because we have more years <laughs> behind us than I think we have in front of us. But um, <laughs> I'm, and, and this is a special occasion, and, and because. And I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put the put the flame up a little bit. Dr. Okay. Goggins is working on a project, a manuscript, and we're gonna actually present uh, some of our background in that manuscript. And I really do hope it comes out. I'm just one of the contributors, and I want you to know that it'll be my first uh, writing con contribution if this comes out. And I hope it does. And it's called uh, uh, from student perspectives from the 1040 uh, from students awesome. to scholars, from yeah. classmates to scholars. So I hope that project does come out. He's pulling all the levers on that thing. So, but yes, I'm originally in uh, Georgia, Hewlett, Georgia. I'm um, originally from Akron, Ohio. Of course, born and raised. Uh, spent time in Cleveland, where I went to school for computers. Back when computers were just now kind of coming out, I had COBOL and Fortran, mm. <laughs> RPG, and M Microsoft DOS was off at the time. I had a floppy disk for those. So that just kind of go way the back there. Yes, floppy disk. So, <laughs> and uh, I started there, and then I ended up uh, moving on to the military, uh, and I was it became an X-ray tech in the military. And we talk about this in the book, and then awesome. did that. I wanted I wanted to continue school. I was going to school on paying out of my own. Uh, I didn't have a lot of grants and things like that. A Pell grant mm -hmm, back then. Mm -hmm. That was it. And so uh, I went on my own, and then I went to the military under the GI Bill, and continued on that way. So. Uh, that took me various places around the world and then back, back to Ohio. It always lands right back in Ohio where I picked up, uh, I wanted to continue on that federal thing that I had going on. So I took it to the right. Postal Service and parlayed that. And I just retired from that three years ago. So my background is mostly in training and management. And my degree is actually specialization is actually in educational leadership and management. And that's been pretty much the crux of it with the undergird of music. No, I could never get away from that music. Everybody, and, and no one argues with me with me about it either. I say, hey, yeah, we already know that. You were doing that when you were a kid. And so there's always been an undergird with that music thing. So I was just uh -huh. here just thankful to be on the panel with uh, Dr. Goggins and yourselves. And um, I was able to take one of his online courses, one of Dr. Goggins' online courses pertaining to um, Africa, Afri uh, Afro African centric uh, rites of passage, and I'm sure he's going to touch on it today. And I'm sure he may even touch on some of the um, restorative practices and and um, uh, social and emotional learning and things of that nature. And then I have some things that I'm going to touch on the more spiritual side, the more biblical side of things, and uh -huh. uh, maybe some philosophical. So I didn't know what how we were going to present it. I know what I have prepared, so we just all going under the power of the Holy Ghost. So. Uh, yes, yes, amen. Yes, yes. That's that's the important part. And that's why I can't when I came to you guys, well, Lord, first of all, the Lord gave me you two guys. And the subject was, how do we get here? And he told me, do not tell them what you're talking about. Let them come from where they want to come. So 
And then what will happen as we go on tonight, it seems like we might, as we go, it might be a part two the way this thing is already moving. Because I don't think we're going to be able to cover everything that we need to cover here. So, Dr. Wright, and I want to end the question, I'm going to lay it before you first. And I'm glad you said that we didn't practice this because we purposely didn't want to practice this. And actually, that's how date night with William and Wendy goes. She normally gives a topic and she tells me or she posts it online and asks me, did I see it? And that's when I know what it is. I don't know ahead of time at all. And, and, and it's good that way because then we depend on the Holy Spirit to lead us what we do. And I want to say welcome to Lena Williamson. Welcome to date night with William and Wendy. And we, we have some folks, I wanted to do Facebook as well, but you know, it's having issues with it. So it's not coming through. So I'm gonna have to go back later and put it on after from the recording of this. But so the question to you, Dr. Wright is, how did we get here? How did and, we get here? Right. So that's such a philosophical question. I could probably uh, bloviate on for at least an hour and a half just by myself. So <laughs> we'll tag team back and forth with a good doctor here as well. But when I first heard this, it took me to the Deborah Cox song when she mentioned, how did you get here? Nobody's supposed to be here. I've tried oh. the love thing the, for the last time. My heart says, no, no, nobody's supposed to be here. But you came along and changed my mind. And so it seems as though that we seem to take the negative every time we hear that. How did we get here? But when you are a child of God or when you are walking in the fear and the admonition of the Lord is not a negative thing, even if we go through negative situations. It says, uh, King David wrote in Psalm 37, the steps of a good man. And we know that the Bible is written in the male form. A lot of it is, is humanity. Man means humanity or human, uh, humans at that point are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. And so we see that even in through the times of adversity that he can bring us through. And I think the doctor, the doctor, he can talk to you more than I can about the shores of West Africa and the Middle Passage and uh, things that go on that we weren't, we weren't brought here slaves. We were made, we were kidnapped and made as a slave. But even through all the adversity and the misuse of scriptures and things of that nature, that we were able to find ways to tap right back into our uh, genealogy, uh, genealogy, and tap right back into our ancestry. And being able to get, uh, build some strength upon that, but from the, but that was all in the natural. But in the spiritual matter, we take God as being sovereign, and He orders our steps. And then we look at being having character, character of a good person. Now, what's a good person? We know people that hey, I, I, my uncle, he worked for uh, uh, Chrysler. He took care of his family. He put all his kids through college. He was a good man. Well, in this sense, when we say good man, we mean a person of righteousness, a person who is aligned with the fear and admonition of the Lord. And we know that all things don't um, don't go right, but all things work together for the good. And so those are the things we mean when we mean the character of a righteous person, good person, and delights in his ways. So his ways are delighted in the Lord, and the Lord delights in his ways. I'm going to put a pin in that right there. And uh, so that's pretty much the premise where I'm going to come from that we got here because of a, of a person of a righteousness, our steps are ordered by the Lord. And okay. uh, welcome Tanya Mitchell. Welcome to Date Night with William and Wendy. Okay, Dr. Goggins, how did we get here? <laughs> the brother said a lot. So <laughs> a part of that is a uh, scene uh, of my thinking, my journey particularly, uh, uh, me laughing at because I swore up and down I would never go into education. I swore up and down I would never get my doctorate. My father had three doctors. My mother got her doctorate when um, I graduated from uh, high school, and I would you know, like looking at her like you did all that to get Dr. Peart in front of your name. Blah, blah, blah. Little did I know <laughs> talking about, uh, how the Lord has a plan for you, right? Mm -hmm. But it was a matter of how do you how do you learn to accept that. Uh, um, even in our sense of anxieties, uh, uh, insecurities, uh, the some of it, you know, they call the um, uh, imposter syndrome. You you come to understand that there's so much that can be 
lay before you that is for you to do that your ancestors have provided for you uh there's others who provided examples of you for you i should say mm -hmm. that even with all of that it is still uniquely yours right. and to come into that um assurance is powerful mm -hmm. right so that how do we get here we get here often unbeknownst to ourselves initially but then when we look back we see the the order of it we see the sense of it uh and the things that was laid out um in a strategy in a a a the way that it has to have unfolded for it to be uh what it is my son's sitting here looking at me got you um and so there's that I can't help but to think also when you ask that question in the context of of uh, this this where we are as a nation, and you in so many ways, I think we we are we're we're being asked to choose uh, a path that takes us back or a path that takes us forward uh do we do we choose to lean into our discomfort to become what we might be uh you know what we have the potential to be uh i think of a quote from uh du bois at all times we must be willing to give up who we are for what we might become Terry Thomas, welcome to Date Night with William and Wendy. Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no, no. So, so you know, we 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 get at these points in which you have to choose, and 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 given who I'm talking to, and 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 the 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 <laughs> the, the what the this the 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 what was set up before me, um, that you know, oftentimes, and talk about the rites of passage as well. We, we find ourselves those moments of having to choose and 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 become what we might be right that that those are the moments of significance and so how do we get to this point of 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 at a crossroads in so many ways uh is is in through the you look at your reflection and see what what is it that got you here Right, right. What are the you prayers? I, I can promise you. Uh, you know, this, this, I, 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 well, my daughter about a month and a half ago came to me and, and it was just, you know, dad, I wanted to say, you know, been praying for you, this, this, that, another. And she, she had no idea the moment I was having. Mm -hmm. And and in so many ways, she has no idea how that saved me. And so, you know, all that to say, I'm getting along with it, but we often find ourselves at points where we have to make choices. And in, in, our, in, in those moments, we take the time to reflect and we'll see how we got here. And so many times it is un- is not by plan by us, but we see the logic and the the faithfulness of God, and how those who have no idea in some cases our ancestors mm -hmm. who don't even know our name didn't know our names but fought for liberty and justice so that we can be in the places that we are. That's how we got here. All right. Yes. So go ahead, Dr. Wright. Oh, and I can. I was just going to piggyback and tag team with the doctor here. We have an uh, uh, academic cipher right here, so to speak. But to take to take that uh, premise with the choices and decisions, and they are presented to us on a daily basis, and whether they be big or small, and they also are used to shape our paths. And uh, mm -hmm. whether it be career cho uh, choices, prefix, uh, how we style our our style of 
clothing for that day. And then we have some other points pertaining to opportunities and risks. Now, every day we have an opportunity and some risks that we can take that will reflect what outcomes would be. And I just want to say to your listeners and, and to ourselves to be intentional. I want to encourage us to be intentional and to be purposeful in our decision making in our choices and, and not so much to get to the best or so uh, pertain paying attention to the journey. Okay. Again, some echo on here. I think I got yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. But um, uh, opportunities and risks. And then pay attention to our relationship and our influences. Okay, they matter. Uh, who, who speaks into our lives? Uh, who do we have getting uh, uh, tutelage from, from mentorship? Um, just just basic information, like when, and I talked about it in our upcoming book that I we, I didn't learn investments, I didn't learn property, I didn't learn ownership, and I don't want to down book though. Book though did great, but back in eighty three, eighty, I did I learned a lot of things, but I had to pick up some things later. But had I been around people, then I would not have been. Hey, get some good credit, get a good job, work, pay your bills, maybe live out in you know Goodyear Heights. And you're doing good. I would have been thinking on a, um, and talking on a higher level than that. And so relationships matter. And then we get challenges and adversity that we may that may be seen or unforeseen. So it's hard to navigate through those without having necessary tools to get through them. Whether it be uh, social, uh, social, emotional learning skills. Do we lead in with our emotions? Do we lead in with logic? Do we lead in spiritually? How do we move? How do we? carry out our day? Are we petty? Are we uh, revengeful? Are we unforgiving? Are the, uh, do we have wounds from our childhood where we bullied, where we molested, or things, all of those type of things where we uh, embarrassed or things like that? Did somebody, what well, we should say, crack on us back on the day and we still want to get them back or they haven't, we haven't forgotten or they haven't forgotten. And then didn't look at our value systems and our beliefs. Those all matter as well. What, what's the, Computer, we talked computers earlier. What is that program that's installed within us? How do we, uh, how does things affect us? What matters? What do we put first? You know, do we put God first? Is it just a cliche or do we really believe that? Do we stand on that? And then, then they had chance. I don't believe in chance and luck. I believe opportunity. I believe preparation meant opportunity. At that time, I do, I do know that serendipitously sometimes when things will happen, like I got a uh, call by Pastor William to be on his platform, and thank you for that. My mom made it, but you know I didn't know. But what, it's not that I lucked up and got it. You you looking at decades of preparation to be here and things like that. So then self reflection and growth matters as well. So all of these things tie together, and I want to just put a bow on it, bring it back home, back to the scriptures that God already had a plan for us, and we saw in Jeremiah twenty nine eleven that I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your betterment and for your welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And so and I want to encourage you to read what happened before that and what after that. They say, well, what if I made all these bad mistakes? Maybe I did some time, maybe I got stuck on substance abuses. We could still come out of that. We could still walk through those and come out. There is a life after that, if we're willing to do the work and to make the steps. And not to be so caught up emotionally on temporary things, but to know that we still have a calling in the future and our decisions that we make and not just for us, it's for uh, others as well, whether it be our spouse, whether it be our children, our circle of influence, our coworkers, our business partners, our perfect people in management, uh, in, in business with or management and, and things of that nature. Amen. So one of the things that, that I want to say now is when we're talking about how do we get here. Now, let's look at, we came from an inner city school and where they say that you're not going to be anything because you don't get the education. But you guys are proof in it. Both of you are walking around with doctorate and and um, the things that they do in their life. But what, it, what do you see as the difference in today's society and compared to when we were coming up, anyone? I, I'll I'll start with with the idea that first you you got to they often try to sell 
right? They they sell you this 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 notion of where you come from and and you people this and and you people that, right? Uh, uh, they try to to convince us that we came from slaves. No, we came from Africans. We came from people. That, they took people from the continent of Africa and enslaved them. They didn't take slaves from Africa, right? Uh, that that the 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 there is a system that tries to convince us of our inferiority so that coming from a book though, you're taught and society affirms somehow or another that the white man's ice is colder. But book to produce gold medal winner, a Tony Award winner, a uh, uh, National Poor Laureate, Gra Grammy winner, Emmy winner, uh, no, the Grammy Grammy winners. Um, there are doctors and scholars and you know folks that come. Right. Truth be told, more uh, you look at what school in Akron puts more black folks in college. Books is at the top of that list, right? But yet they try to sell it because, quote unquote, is that school? This book to school is a black school, right? Now, most of the schools at this at this point in, in, in Akron Public Schools are, are, are black schools, majority um, black schools. Uh, but they they try to sell us on that. So a part of that of why is it that we are able to be who we are is consistent with well, what else were we going to do? <laughs> right? That's that's okay. Uh, you show me another school in the country that produced three Gates Millennium Scholars. That's a that's a very short list, right? But but somehow or another there's that, and I think in so many ways it represents the issue and concern of our people in this country, right? Uh, and, and we have to also be careful with how do we get here writ large, large concept, philosophically looking at the, 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 the journey of African people in this society. We got here through struggle. And our struggle made a difference. And, and sometimes we try, people will try to tell us and, and some of the activist folks who, you know, back in the day, black folk did something, and right now black folk ain't doing nothing, da 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 or, or, you know, what exactly, you know, black folks don't ever do nothing, and, or the, the struggle, you know, movement didn't do this, that, and other. It's like, eh, not, not so fast. There was a time period in this country that there was a black person being lynched burned, hang from the tree, dismembered, body parts being displayed at the local grocery store. Once every eight days, over a course of 86 years. Once every eight days, over the course of 86 years, somebody in this country being lynched. That doesn't happen anymore. Police brutality. It happens, but nowhere near the rate that it used to happen. Even with the spike of crime, violent crime in this country, particularly in our inner cities, that's happened after the pandemic, nowhere near what it was back in the 80s and in the late 70s. So a part of the part of the discussion, the part of the, the thing that we have to be very careful of because the narrative that people try to give us is our, of our inferiority and our ineffectiveness and that as a community, we don't do much or do anything. And yet, 
when you look at the history, if we didn't do anything, why'd you come cross the seas to come get us? If we didn't do anything, how is it that you become the richest nation based upon our labor? If we didn't do anything, how is it that you almost name the whatever? The, you're going to see black African in ingenuity genius involved in it. The internet doesn't happen without a black inventor. Going to the moon doesn't happen without black folk, African ing ingenuity. And when we talk about this society even today, where we are today, it happens because of our people. We are a better country. We are more American, living up to American ideals because of the struggles and the insistence of African people in this country saying, here's what you said in your constitution, live up to it. This country is more American and lives up to American ideals because of us. So how do we get here? We get here through struggle. Where there is no struggle, there is no progress, Frederick Douglass says. Yes. How do we how do we move forward? We continue to struggle. We, we struggle towards the calling of God. We, we struggle towards the high ideal. I want to I want to interrupt you right there. I, I read something and it it was pretty good. I can't I, I'm a I can't give it to you 100. percent But you have five generations, so you had a you had a, a dad or a great grandfather that started off. And he was walking mm -hmm. and he worked real hard. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm gonna say, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and he went from walking to, to to his his son driving a car, and then from his son driving a Cadillac and to, and so forth and so on. And then they got to the last last one, and the last one began to walk again because the, the point was where there, like you said, where there's no struggle, there's no progress. So mm -hmm. these these bad grandfathers and great grandfather made it easy for everybody else. So now it was no struggle, so they didn't know what to do. So then they revert back to the beginning because mm -hmm. now they have to start back over again. So what I, I brought that up because I want to say something to you, gentlemen. You you have kids. But you look, you taught your kids a certain way of how to overcome the struggles, how to become better. But let's look at society as a total. How do you feel as men, as men teachers and educators, the way that the kids don't respond to, to the teaching or respond to the struggle to make themselves better? I go back to uh, and what the doctor was saying. He, and he, he didn't get to the part about the restorative uh, or transformational uh, process that we go through, go through. Now, each generation goes through the same cyclical learning process and it's transformative and it's restorative. However, in the effort of uh, wanting our children to do better than us, I, I just, I, I'm wondering if we did not, in some instances, cause them a disservice where they didn't have the same grind as we did. And they may have missed some of the foundational things. And we talked a little bit earlier about MS DOS. Well, when they were here, they had the internet. We had to build, we had to create, and we learned to build from scratch. I used to play out in the yard and we didn't have anything, but we made something. We created our own Olympics. And then, so it was based on the foundations and the value systems. And I wanna go and add something else more to it as well. Uh, along with the struggle, I believe that we do reap what we sow. What energies, what direction, where are we aligned, who and what are we aligning ourselves with? What do we value as important? If it's the party, then you're going to get more party. If it's the clothes, then you're just going to keep buying clothes. But if you want uh, knowledge, if you want education, then you will feed that. Whatever has that appetite, and there's courses and everything about that. What appetite are you feeding? 
or what uh, uh, innate ability do you wish to hone? If it's basketball, then we play. If it's, it's academics, if it's chess, whatever it is. And like as the doctor was saying, I worked on drums. I started when I was 78, uh, 77. I got a drum set for Christmas. I didn't get any formal training. I just picked up some sticks and I just went started listening to the radio and I went at it. And they said, no, I'm playing for Bokto Band. So that whatever you direct your attentions to, whatever you sown your seeds to, whether it's biblical things, I had the King James Version of the Bible. I didn't understand how, probably 75% of it, but the part I did, I latched on to it and I faked the rest. And I can quote a couple of scriptures and I just said, Jesus is alive because he's alive in me. And I took that and ran with it until I can do more. And that's the same thing, uh, my approach. And uh, I decided, now I did do some detrimental things and distractions and got off track, no doubt about it. Uh, well documented, but however, I still had that foundation that was there that allowed me to say, hey, you know what, you're messing up. You live in beneath your privileges. There's more to you than just that. Look at, look at what's going on around you. Why are you still here? So we want to know, how did we get here? First thing we need to see God if, and ask, why am I here? And what is the purpose you have for me? Not my will, but thine will be done. I will mess this thing up. I've already messed it up in some instances. I've already made damage. So when you, we reap in what you sow, if you want to sow good energy, you want to sow ministry, you want to sow towards uh, education, then that's where you want to go. And other other thing I want to bring out is the, the soul of, it says in Proverbs 13, the soul of a sluggard craves and gets nothing. Where are you spending your time? Are you wasting it? We all get seven days a week, 365 days a year, one fourth if you count the leap year, but we all get the same amount of time. So what are you doing with yours? Are you investing yours? Are you squandering it? Are you wasteful with it? Are you slothful with it? What are you doing with it? Does it matter to you? If it doesn't matter, are you where you think you should be? What purpose more do you have? Are you enjoying the journey? Are you walking in the steps in the fear and the mission of the Lord? Are you just taking things by happenstance? Are you just accepting it as it comes? What existence? Are you existing or are you living? So to me, I began to take that seriously, and I just didn't want just the status quo. I wanted something a little bit more. I was never satisfied with just getting get along to get along or get by. I wanted to be able to have an impact, leave a legacy, and then pass that on to my children the best I could. Amen. That's, that's good. Now, one of the things that I always say is when people, and you said something about time, and I give it to you from a, a background, a, a biblical background here. God says that that he, whatever he's created, he put, he put into our hand to, to, to control. And if we understand time is something that God created. So that means that we control time. And one of the things that I come to find out in, in doing ministry and being able to go through all these years is we never run out of time. We run out of planning. And so when people said, man, I, I ran out of time. No, we didn't plan our day right. We, we ran out of planning for everything. And so when I look, when I look at today's society and, and when I, when I looked at this question and continue to look at the, the daily activities of people and how they get frustrated is because they never really plan their day proper. So that was one of the things. And go back to what you said in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts that I have towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. I remember when I was a track coach at, at Kimmore, the head track coach, and these kids couldn't get get the understanding of what I was trying to teach them. And I, I just said, Lord, what can I tell them to help? And we were sitting there and I'm looking at them and I and I and I just stopped because the Lord said, This is what you say to me. So I looked at each of them. I said, Listen, you guys are winners. You can win. If nobody ever told you that you can win, I'm telling you now you can win. And from that point right there, I seen a difference in every kid that was there. And it made the interesting part about it. I think a few weeks later, or, or the actually the next meet we had, we met, we was up against Bookton of all teams. And we won. And Coach Scott looking at this, I said, Coach Scott, it ain't gonna change. We beat you. We beat you. But this is what I see 
nowadays we don't have anybody sitting these kids down or these young folks and tell them that they're winners and, and that they're more than what they that, that their pants beneath their butt. They're more than that. They're more than in the than the B word for the girls. So one of the things that I used to do to my kids, I always said I wanted my kids better than I ever was. But when I spoiled my kids, I did it differently. My wife didn't, she didn't kind of, kind of agree with it, but I wanted to make sure they had everything they could, but I didn't give it to them on their timing. I gave it to them when I felt they should have it, not when they wanted it, but when they when I wanted them to have it. So they didn't think that they could, they would have everything at all, at all times and everything. And it made a difference in them. It made a difference in them. And as far as the last thing we do, and I'm going to turn to the next question on so my uh, one grandson said he wants some weights for Christmas. I don't have problems with weights, but the part that she doesn't understand is I told my son, and he didn't quite understand it. I said, when he was a young kid, I said, you give me 250 push-ups, 250 sit-ups, and 250 uh, body squats per day. He thought I was telling him that I was going to make him bigger, but it's not. What I, what I told him, I want this because I know you're dedicated if you do that. And I'm not going to give you something that you're not dedicated to. Exactly. And she didn't quite understand it. She, she said, I told you not to tell them that when they was young, but it wasn't about telling them that. It was about show, seeing how they were going to respond. So I see in our society today that too many parents reward their kids with bad. I mean, do, reward them for doing bad with good things is what I want to say. Get, get some response. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so much, so much there. Uh, so, the the well, I, I go back to what you said initially that that the hard times produce strong men. Okay. Strong men produce good times. Yes, sir. Good times produce weak men. Yes. Weak men produce hard times. Yes, I right? see. Uh, and so. The thing that we have to do, and and, and we, we, so many of us included, we know the struggle that we went through, and we want to protect our children from the struggle. But it's the struggle, right? Nobody got strong being comfortable. Yes. Right? <laughs> now, what we also know is that 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 that, that stuff out there. And those things out there that we struggle with was dangerous. So we often want to protect our children from the danger, which is good. But in the protecting of the from the danger, we still got to provide them the struggle. And they and there's ways to put you can do struggle where you can say, hey, do these 250 push-ups and squats. One. It's gonna, it may not make you big, but it will make you strong. And two, it will show dedication. And three, you will see, you'll get the benefit of knowing that you've accomplished something. Yes. And and the hard work that goes into it, and that carries over, right? So uh uh the proverb, no good man. Well, what's the problem? Uh, no good man is raised on a bed of downs. Right? That, that one again? No good man is raised on a bed of downs, on a bed of feathers. Okay. okay. Right? We need some uncomfort. That yes. makes us stronger. And we can provide that for our children in safety as well, right? We can, we can, we don't have to throw them out to the streets. We, but we can still provide the struggle because it's, it's it's in the struggle that you get stronger, right? Uh, so that so that when they get of age, they can handle the streets. They can handle going, uh, uh, going away, right? So so that kind of thing, right? And and so we have to have that standard. And I talk about in my book that the Maasai uh, have this as a part of their rites of passage would have to go and go kill a lion. Right now, the Maasai is a group of folks that, that value cattle on a savanna. Right, so 
having the skill to go out and kill a lion works in that community. But as, but if that is how, what we used to do way back when, we may not be in the savannah or we may not be facing lions, but we have something that we value and there's something out there that's trying to get it. And it still makes sense for us to train our children how to protect what we value against those that would attack it. So as we move forward, Sankofa, we talk about this concept of Sankofa, it is no taboo to go back and fetch what once worked. It doesn't mean that you bring, just because we used to do what we do it now, but go back and think about, reflect, see how you got over, see how what worked before, bring those concepts. You don't have to do the exact same thing, but do the thing that worked, the struggle, the learning, the building of strength. Bring that forward in today's context and be deliberate in providing it for our children. Right, that's good. Right? Uh, yeah. So, so that, that part, right? The other thing is then, because when you do that, then tools become tools and you're not controlled by it. Okay. One of the big things right now in education is, is folks tripping out about AI and you know, artificial uh, intelligence. Uh, and it's like, well, if, you, if, you, if you're doing proper education, AI doesn't make a difference. <laughs> if what you're doing is what John doing 90 years ago was calling it old, it antiquated. If you what you're doing is rote memory and and fill out and uh, uh, multiple choice. If that's your assessment, that's what you're doing. Then yeah, AI is going to blow you up. But 90 years ago, John Dewey was calling that old. <laughs> but if what you do in terms of your engagement is <clears throat> here's this instruction now. How does this help you be the person you say you want to be? No AI can do, no AI can, can do that. If here's this, let's look at your community and see what's going on. What do you, what do you want to do to help? What do you want to do to, to fix that thing over there? What's that, how you want to make that over there more beautiful? We can use AI to give you some ideas, but to actually go do it, no AI can do that, but it's how we, how do we learn how to be human and being deliberate in our humanity, then tools become tools and not something that controls us. And we learn to be in our proper place in terms of centering our humanity, centering what it is. And then you talk about uh, there's another proverb comes out of Africa that talks about, or, or this saying, the two most important days of your life, the day that you, you was born, the day you figure out why, and the day you figure out why. <laughs> right? So, yes, again, a proper education is about figuring out that why you was born. My experience has been, you talk about how these young people are. And what you and what you alluded to, Billy, Pastor Billy. Um, no, no, I say Billy too sometimes. <laughs> all right. That that so many times where I work with some young boys, so many times to engage them as if they're intelligent, to engage them as if they got dignity, and and not not some special thing. This is my standard. This is of course you. Of course you're a genius. And they look at me like, huh, what? Mm -hmm. I said, as you were talking about, to engage these young people, of course you're a winner. How can you not be? Understand the notion of, will you understand your God's creation? You understand when they pack those boats off the continent of Africa. Well, first, they put you in a room. Yeah, I would uh, given I'm about this about what you what you what you're the room that you're in, about about like a 
a, a 10 by 15 room. They would stack close to two to 300 people in that room. It would be so packed that the dead couldn't fall to the floor. They would put you in. And so now, again, remember that they're, they're looking for people to work. So when I go look for people to work, I'm looking for strong people. Right? I'm not I'm not picking the the, the weak. Don't bring me no the weak person, the sickly. I'm I'm gonna put pack in that room strong people. Now who survives that? The strongest of the strong. Then I'm gonna put you on a boat, pack you like sardines of the people that's left. Almost a third or more of those people die. So you got the strongest of the strong packed on a boat. Who survives that? The strongest of the strongest strong. We are the people that they could not kill. And if you begin to understand, if we can present that to our young people, that mentality, you got it. We didn't lose our culture. We forgot some stuff, yes. But you go to any black person's home, go to your grandmama's home, and we got a fruit basket out in there someplace. <laughs> Even if it's made out of plastic. <laughs> we got one. We got one, right? right? That's an African thing. Okay. If you was from Europe, you would have a bread basket. That's an African thing. Okay. When we pray, if we serious, what are we going to do? We're going to touch and agree, right? Mm -hmm. Put our hands on it. That's African. Europeans weren't doing that. And if we real serious, we're going to form a circle around it. That's African. Those things, how do we get here? Because we manage our humanity. We kept in touch. Even if we forgot the name, it was in us and we practice it. Well, I want to touch Connected on to you. that source. And how do we then, with our own children, we have to go from just doing things to being more deliberate, particularly as technology comes up, particularly as we have more freedom we have to be more deliberate in our humanity. I want to touch Pastor, on- You asked um, something? Oh, go ahead. go ahead. Yes, yes. I want to touch on what you were talking about, doctor, because I just uh, heard and read uh, about our first woman on earth was, of course, Eve. Mm -hmm. And when they did a study, her bone structure, her DNA looks just like me and looks just like your wife, looks just like your sister. And what the young lady said that was of another race, she said, whether y'all know it or not, we all got black in us. I don't care how many times you mix the race, how many times you try to get away from the race. She said, in the beginning, we all started out black. She said, we got lighter skin. We got lighter as time went on. She said, but the first woman on earth was a black woman, was Eve. She said, so we need to stay away from being prejudiced because this is where we all were created from the beginning. And I, I want to piggyback we were all on, African. Right. I want to piggyback on um, Bukto. Um, when I was at Bukto, my confidence in what I wanted to do and who I was grew from Schumacher to Perkins to Bukto. I mean, and we're going to talk about a school I believe we are so successful at book, as graduates from Bookdale High School because our confidence level was here. When we walked into a room, whether it be in a sporting event or rather just in homecoming, wherever it was, prom, we were very confident in who we were. And you couldn't take that from us. That's why Kenmore was intimidated. That's why other schools were intimidated when we showed up. Because we had that confidence when we walked in the room. We Look, we weren't that good my years uh, playing on uh, football. But when we showed up on the scene, our band was off the chain. Everybody was to right. band play. Um, it was something about what we had everybody else wanted. 
They wanted to come to Booker, but they didn't come because, you know, mom and dad might not want them there because it was an all black school. Uh, mom and dad wanted to make sure they got a better education, so they sent them to St. B. or Hoban. Didn't know that the teachers that were teaching us was teaching us really well. All we had to do was get it and apply it to our lives as adults. I didn't go to college. Um, and Miss uh, Saron, our counselor, she said, well, you know, Wendy, what you want to do? And I just told her we wanted to go to Akron U just so she wouldn't, you know, stay on me about going to college. But I knew I wasn't going to uh, Akron U. I had no no, no desire to go. Um, my mom said, you know, your choice. She worked at Goodrich. She was making great money to over $20 an hour back then. So her mindset was get you a good job and be successful at it. That was how we were raised. But you're not going to sit here and be lazy. Couldn't be lazy. You wasn't allowed to be lazy. So that's what we grew up in. And that's why I believe so many successful people come from Bookto because we didn't play. We didn't play. We were very confident in what we wanted. We were competitive. We were very competitive, whether it was in grades, whether it was in sports, whatever, academic, whatever, even the band. Whatever you did, you were very competitive in it. I remember Deborah going to um, the class, typing class. And I looked at them walking in the room. I got out of typing because I couldn't stop looking at my fingers. I kept cheating. And the teacher kept saying, when do you got to quit looking? Well, I wasn't that good. I got to be a C in that class. And I was like, well, you know what? I'm going to performing arts because I know I can act. So I'm going to go to that class because I was a tap dancer. So in performing arts, I can tap dance. I can sing. I can do what it was I like to do. But when I got older, I said, you know what? I should have stayed in that typing class another semester. I needed to learn how to type. Now I'm pecking as an adult. I'm pecking on the on the keys now. But my kids and my husband laugh at me because they type like geniuses. But what I'm saying is that you knew where you were when you were at Bookton. You know what group to get into because there was no, you should go here because you look like this person. You should go here because you look like that person. You went where you fit in at. I fit in in performing arts. And I just want to reiterate that we need to know where we came from like we were talking about. And that's how we got here. We were very confident and who we were, and what, who, and who we belong to, and what we're doing now, it shows. I'm going to interrupt her. <laughs> <laughs> you better, because you know I keep I know. going. <laughs> she will take the breath. But she preached a message. And I can't think of the name of the message. And it was interesting. It's, we've been here for an hour. If you want to keep going, it's up to you guys. We, we can go some more. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I got, I, I'm going to have to step out in just a little bit, but this is good. I'm going to stay here for a little okay. bit longer. So she preached a message and, and what it was, and it was talking about to men of color, why do you feel, I mean, you have to understand they intimidated of you mm -hmm. because they fear you because they know the confidence you have. So that's why they really tear you down because you don't understand who you are. And that's where, so now watch this question. Or let me give you an example before I get to the question. So I look back to the Industrial Revolution. And what happened in the Industrial Revolution? Before that, you had dads taking their sons out to the field with them mm -hmm. to help, to nurture them, to build them up. As we see, Adam took his son and worked in the field. But then you had the Industrial Revolution come along. And in that, it took, the, it took the dad out of the home and it kept the sons around the moms. So we start seeing an issue and a problem there because the dad wasn't there to teach the boy the heavy labor skills that he was supposed to have anymore. It was taken away from him. So what do, you, what do you think about that in part of how do we get here? What, what is your part of the Industrial Revolution taking a man out of the home I see, where, I see where, and, and, and I definitely want to hear what Dr. Goggins want to say, but I see where we have abdicated our duty uh, based whether it's systematic, whether it's uh, inference, whether it's um, intentional or not. But we have to get to the place and get back to the place that no matter what they throw at us, that once we know what the foundation is and once we know what our rightful place is, in our king, in the kingdom, in our kingdom, our kingship is we should not allow our position to be moved. And us, uh, uh, us chess players know that that king doesn't move. No matter how many times the other pieces on the board can go around, we may castle, or we may take a step or two, but we basically stay put. And we 
designate and we design and we protect. But once they have hamstrung us mentally, now some of them may not be slaves physically, but now once we become slaves mentally, that lets us feel inferior. And it was all a test. It was all a, uh, it was all a, a trap to make us feel um, that we're not worthy. That we're, and they're still doing it now. You can turn on the news now and they'll still try to do it. And it's something I wanted to highlight when you went back to Kenmore. Now, I don't appreciate them whooping my alma mater like that, but when you elevate the conversation, when you not accept lukewarm or mediocrity and say, and we don't do participation, and A was was as excellent, B was was good, but C was see if you can do better, D was just unacceptable. And when we get back to that mindset now, if they have some type of mental challenge, learning challenge, that's a different thing. But the majority, even then, we can still find some type of creative ways of mm -hmm. learning. But when we get back to just not accepting, what happened was we got too busy, we got distracted, we got off track, and we lost some of the value because by the time I get home at five, six o'clock, I just don't have the energy to put into it where I should. So we, in sense, did the atom. We stood silently when we should have been speaking up. And that was one thing. But once we get back to elevating our conversation, not accepting mediocrity, and only accepting our kingship and our, our queenship and in in, in teaching them who they are, what stock they come from, the pedigree that they are. And you are a kingdom kid, a child of the most high. We don't accept any mediocrity. And I can use uh, Joseph for an example when he was sold off into slavery by his own brothers, but yet he became the second in charge because he refused to stay caught up with the wicked. He didn't he didn't bow down to that. He used the gift, the God-given gift that we talked about, and it worked out for them. He was able to interpret dreams. So whatever that thing is that you have that God has given you, use that gift. And I'm going to go back to what he said. I'm going to flex like uh, the doctor did. What I wrote in my dissertation was about the appreciative inquiry. And it's a Dr. Cooper writer who was at Case Western Reserve, Cleveland, Ohio, 1985. He came up with a theory that we go back to where we succeeded, go back to the things that that mindset when we were succeeding, when we were, we wanted the big house in, in Fairline at that time, or we wanted to drive the Coupe de Ville or what have you, but that's all we knew. We thought that was successful at that time. And we wanted those things and we went after it, but then along the way, we may have gotten distracted. Maybe someone take ill, maybe we lost a family member. And at each time it, 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 it dampened our spirit, somewhat dumbed us down and we started settling. And we got comfortable, as we talked about earlier. Comfortability leads to complacency. And now you're like spoiled milk. And the scripture talks about, I'd rather you be hot or cold. I can deal with one and just lukewarm warm mess. I'm going to throw you up. You're terrible. You're no good to me at all. I can't use you. So we have to get back to not advocating our duty, stand up in the face of adversity, and stand for justice, as it, as it says in Amos, that justice runs like a stream and uh, like a, a running water, and I'm misquoting it, but Amos 5 and 24, to go back to standing up for justice and things that are right, things that not accepting mediocrity, elevating that conversation as we're doing right now, and getting back to the things where we should be with moral integrity. Hey, sure, sure. Deborah said we were just family at Book, though. That's the truth. We're we the family, for sure. So, we are I, I can tell you now, even, uh, even now, uh, uh, because they're still over here messing with Boto, trying to do different things. And you put the hootie hoot out and, and tell them Griffin Nation showing up. They start, they pay attention to that. Uh, even down downtown know that, uh, and, it, and, it, it, and they test us, but they know, oh, Boto's about to come up, show up up here uh, yeah. in, in the Griffin Nation and, and uh, alumni. But I think, Billy, what you were saying in terms of, you know, taking the father out of the home, right? Uh, and and it goes back to what I was saying about technology. As technology happens, mm -hmm. you know, in the in the in the in the bill of goods that they sell is, you know, it 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 provides you more time. It it makes things more comfortable, and it does in many ways. But we have to be determined. What Dr. Wright is talking about. We still have to be human. We still have to know that, yes, uh, I don't have to go out and break my back and, and share crop anymore. 
But when I had all my family out here with me, struggling, there's something to that. So I don't, and so I'm not, you know, by no means are we saying advocating going back to a time in which we was all out here struggling. But make the time to be together, to learn together, to pass on those skills, right? Uh, I tell you, with my 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 children and my youngest in particular, most recently, you know, hey, uh, I need to I need to we gonna I just got this grill. Come on out here, learn how to use this screwdriver. Let's put this thing together, right? Uh, I'm about to change this light switch. Come over here with me. Take a look at this. This is what I'm doing. Go down, find a fuse box. This one, Dad? Yeah, that one. Okay. Come on back up here. Take a look at this. Don't touch that one. But being very deliberate in teaching to him is what we're about to do. So that you can learn this. Uh, and I think that's that's the part that we 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 have to do in it in 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 the kind of thing that I'm so glad to even you know, taking the time to have the date night and to have these common conversations is well, to, is being deliberate. Yeah, to piggyback what you're saying is a lot of what we come to find out now, and you hear it a lot, especially in, in, in ministry, the part where, where, you know, you used to sit around grandma's porch and grandpa's porch, and you sit there and communicate, like you said, you bring your kids. But when big, as they say, big mama and big papa left, a lot of that 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 wholesomeness left us as well. We don't have that togetherness like we have that we used to have. So that that's one of our focuses here in this household is to bring our family together. Like the at the Sunday at the Sunday service, we come into the house and we have dinner at one house, and we're there sharing together and doing things together, where we can bring that education back. And, you know, one of the things I share with a lot of the people in ministry as well is why do you think, where did the wife serving her husband come from? And a lot of them, you know, they, don't we just do that for respect? No, they don't understand that a wife served her husband because he, in, in, in the slavery days, he was in the field all the days, all day long and getting disrespected all day. So when he came home, she wanted her man to be respected and felt like he was home. We don't see that no more. We don't see things like that. And we got, and like you said, we don't want to go back to old ways the way it used to be. But some of, like you said, I don't, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but we keep putting things on it to keep it rolling. Mm -hmm. And we take, we take some of the things out that keep that wheel rolling. And this is where we begin to see man, this is messed up. This is jacked up. So how did we get here? Because a lot of us, we go back to it, and I, I'm going to toward, towards it ministry way now, how I instruct people, how did we get here? Well, you gave up your right. You gave it up when you decided not to be strong, to not understand, as you guys both said, that you're king of the king of God, of, of the kingdom. If you will understand God has put so much more in you to be a better person, and you gave, as you see, you gave up your birthright when you wanted to go out there and sell drugs, when you wanted to call her out of her name, when you wanted to make the fast money, as you say, if you wanted to drive the Cadillac and all that, you gave up your right. So then you put your place, you get to that position because you didn't want it. You wanted to give it away and didn't want to keep it. And so we see that happen a lot. Go ahead, Dr. Wright. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And we, we abdicated our duty. We got out of position. We ended up on the sideline, ineffective, uh, uh, impotent. We ended uh, out of out of service and out of order and all of the above. And I just had one more point to make that even in the face of those adversities, what made the um, uh, Martin Luther King and the Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, uh, John Lewis is strong that even in the face of their adversity, even in the face of incarceration and uh, battering, beating, they stood strong and continued on. And there's more, uh, Stokely Carmichael, uh, um, uh, H. Rap Brown, some more that continue on. And I just want to leave with this last point. It says in Romans 
uh, 5 and 1 in, in New King James Version, that therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice. And this is the part we have to get back to, rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. Now that takes adultery, that takes maturation, that takes adulthood for that. That's not for, for the weak and the feeble. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And no one likes to go through things, but those things will help us to go through more things. Perseverance and perseverance, character. It helps build our character. We were not handed everything. We had to work for some things. The character is what gave us the hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because we continue to hope. It's, insati it's insatiable, it's inexhaustible, and it's unending and uh, does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given us. So this is something that we can stand on, that we can keep as our motto. And then we have to remind one another every now and again. And someone has to remind me too. Sometimes, hey, remember what you just said? Well, now you got to go do it. That's good. Anything else, Dr. Goggins, before we get to go? Uh, like I said, no, this, this, to be deliberate, right? To be deliberate, to take those times uh, and, and to whoever's listening, you know, value those, those opportunities, right? Because I know like my own sons, I, you know, I pour into my sons and then get them around some good people and they'd be like, you know what, dad, so-and-so said so-and-so and so-and-so. I'm like, I've been telling you that for 10 years, <laughs> but you needed to hear from someone else, right? Right. Uh, and it's and it's like that you 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 you're planting seeds and 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 those kinds of things. And, but we should never take for granted those those things that that help us to be where we need to be. Right? Uh, uh, there are people. There is a society that's trying to convince you it's not that valuable. Another thing, you know, you like if it's not that valuable, then why are you struggling so hard to take it? If it's if it's not that valuable, why you got this whole system set up to deny me who I am? If I'm not valuable, if 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 my heritage, my understanding of myself isn't so valuable, why you put so much effort in telling this lie? Right? If it wasn't valuable, you could just let me be who I am, and what nothing come of it. But they put all that effort into it, and it's for a reason. But at the end of the day, we have to be deliberate uh, in it and 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 trust that, as as I think we started off with, all things work together for the good for those who love the Lord and call and are called according to His purpose. Right. So, figure out what your purpose is, and it's in that process of learning and becoming, you see the fullness. In the full power of God, even in spite of yourself, sometimes that if you put good, intentional, honest effort to serve the will of God, and 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 like I said, through those tribulations, you 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 see the hope, you 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 your faith gets strengthened because you're like, man, you look back and you look. And you see the power of someone praying for you. You know, my grandmama prayed for me, had me on my mind, right? Because there, there's no way in the world this was me doing that. Right, right. That's good. Right? I can, I can promise you that. There was no way in the world this was me. This is because somebody prayed for me. This is because Frank Osborne and, and Sophronia Osborne and and uh, uh, Amos and uh, well, it was Amos and Sophronia. It was Frank and Judy, my great 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 grandparents. Did certain things that provided that allowed Moses to be Moses and Evangeline. So when somebody, because Moses was out here teaching uh, folks to read so they can go vote, and this white man walked up on him and pulled a gun, and the gun. Uh, jammed. So I can be here? And you're going to try to tell me that I don't 
what I do is not important. No, 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 no. But that's also very convicting. That means, as you say, uh, uh, Brother Tim, you say, you know, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time, right? Be deliberate. Know that, know that our, what we have to contribute, what God has put in us to do is valuable enough to be deliberate about it. We ought not advocate our responsibilities. We ought not waste our time uh, and, and definitely not listen to someone who tried to convince us of somehow or another what we are and who and what God has created us to be is inferior. That's good. Gentlemen, I want to thank you both. And I'm sure we're, once we get this posted to the right places, we're going to need some another time to do this again. Because we just scratched the surface. We just scratched the surface of um, what I really wanted to talk about. I'll leave you guys with this. I preached a message a few weeks ago. The rain, it was called, entitled The Rain for Our Future. And you guys basically hit on when you talk about the tribulations and the trials. So in Zechariah 10 and 1, it says, ask the Lord for the for rain. In the time of the latter rain, the Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. So I asked the question when I, when I gave him this message, I said, and it was, it was so profound because it was raining when I went to the church. So it, it was in, ask for the rain. And I asked him, I said, how many of you sitting here has asked God to stop the rain from, from coming? And I said, it's no trick question. I have did this before. Mm -hmm. And I said, you, you don't understand what you're asking for when you ask that. And this is what I see with our society today. They ask for a lot of things to stop. This, if we understand the rain it's, it's the meaning of rain to God. It means empowering, not only empowering, but cleansing and, and, and healing. So when I told him, when you ask God to stop the rain, you asking God to stop giving you his power. You asking God to stop, stop uh, healing the earth. You stopping, you asking God, stop that drug dealer and allow him to continue doing what he want to do because I don't want it to be clean. We, we don't want the power anymore. So, and I, you know, to understand this, to, I told him about the three clouds. You have a cumulus cloud, you have a nimbus cloud, and then you have a cumulus nimbus cloud. And this is where, what you guys are talking about. The cumulus cloud sits way up there and, and looks good. The planes that have no problem with flying through this because it, it has no issues, no problem. It won't have no harm. Then you have the nimbus cloud where it begins to be dark and you get rain, you get a light rain. But this is what people don't want. And this is what we talked about earlier, Dr. Wright and Dr. Douglas. They don't want the cloudiest nimbus cloud because you get hail, you get thunder, and you get lightning, and you get heavy rain. So and you can you get this with all the turmoil in the land. So people don't want turmoil in their lives. So you can't get the power of God with all without the cumulus nimble with the rain and with the thunder and the lightning and all that to take place in your life. That's what's going to build you. That's what's going to heal you. And that's what's going to make us strong. So we got to watch what we're saying and what we're doing. Got to watch it. Amen. Got to watch it. But I thank God for you, gentlemen. I thank you. And like I said, we're going to have to set up another one because it's some powerful teaching and learning that's coming out of this. And I think our younger folks, and not only our younger folks, just, just people in general from listening to this is going to be healed and then begin to, to see something from a new mindset. You know, I always tell we can't change your mind, but I work on a mindset. And when I work on a mindset, that's what changes your mind. That's what changes your mind. So God bless you guys, and if God continues to increase you with wisdom and knowledge, and I thank you. I thank you. You just you don't know what you did, not only for me and my wife and date night with William and Wendy, but the people that's going to watch this. You you guys did a lot. You did a lot. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. the opportunity, sir. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's always good to be around good brothers. Amen. Amen. You as well. Amen. Thank you. Amen. So we're going to close up. And Dr. Wright, I want you to close us up in prayer. 
So, sure, sure. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity to commune with you. You said in your word that we're two or three are gathered together in your name, and there you are in the midst. And we just thank you that you are in the midst. And we just uh, take these words, and you said, be ye doers of the word and not just hearers only. And we're not uh, fooling ourselves, Lord God. And we just pray that we are continuing the work that you've given us, and uh, even from the 60s and 70s on, on through till now, Lord God, until until dot, dot, dot. We are in the midst of that dash. We have the start date, sunrise, they call it. Then we end the dash, and then we have the sunset. But what we do at that dash, Lord God, we're working it out now. We thank you for leading our steps. We pray for God's family, Campbell family, all those who are in attendance, all those who will uh, listen to this at a later time, that is still just as fresh and the spirit is moving as it is now. We thank you for your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you, gentlemen. Thank you again.